It's All Saints Day. Hua! All Saints Day, a day so big that we celebrate it by dressing up the night before, going door to door, and eating as much candy as humanly possible. All Saints Day! It's a day that we've been preparing for by decorating our homes, by carving giant vegetables, and by telling spooky stories, being sure to get the flashlight under our chins at just the right moment. Ooh. But hey, all the hard work has paid off, friends, because we made it. Here we are, All Saints Day, November 1st. The day in the Christian calendar year when we pause to remember those who have come before us in the faith. Ooh. Of course, it's not exactly a high holy day. And yes, we did borrow it from the ancient Druids. But we must really like to celebrate this day. Why else would we go through all of the effort? Now, it just might be me, but maybe you haven't noticed, but it seems as if the All Saints Day might be slightly overshadowed, just a tinge by the festivities of the evening before. No? <laughs> by uh, what we traditionally called All Hallows' Eve, or what has come to be known simply as Halloween. That night when traditionally, traditionally we lighted watch fires in memory of those who have come before us in faith. Now how we got lighted pumpkins from watch fires is a bit of a mystery. But we do know that the tradition of dressing up in costume was a way of warding off evil spirits. And the practice of going door to door harkens back to the 17th century peasants who would go door to door begging for food or coin in exchange for prayers. There's even some evidence that children used to be prepared to do a song or a little dance or some act in order to receive that coin or food. The trick part of trick. Or treat. And while it's true that Halloween has lost some of its original flavor, some for good and some for ill, it still has candy, friends. <laughs> it would be a mistake to get rid of it altogether. After all, in the end, Halloween is more treat than trick. Because if nothing else, Halloween forces us to pause for one night a year to look at the world in a new way. We dress up as someone else. We go door to door begging for food. And we remember that things might not always be like they are. Friends, sometimes we need to look at the world in a different way. And we should embrace any excuse we get. Maybe it's a reminder that the world could change. Of course, if we were able to get Halloween and All Saints Day back together again, married again at last, we just might be able to hold up something even greater that this is the moment we have been given to change the world. We can look back at the people who have come before us and realize that just as they used their time wisely, now is our chance to do something new. And so today, on this All Saints Day, on this day after Halloween, on this day when we received by the grace of God an extra hour of sleep to sleep off that sugar, 
we pause that we might consider what we might do in the time that we have. We are aided in our adventure today by the book of Revelation. Dun, dun, dun! That's right, the book of Revelation, one we don't talk about too much, one we'd like to pretend wasn't actually there. The book of Revelation, the final book of our Bible, a book that's fitting for the day after Halloween because we are convinced it is filled with very spooky stories. Get your flashlights ready. Ooh. It's a book that we have considered to be about one thing and one thing alone, and that, of course, is the end of the world. The time when the dead will rise from their graves and Christ will finally sit in judgment over the rest of of the world. It's a book that has been so strange that people have spent centuries trying to uncode the secret messages locked within, calculating intricately the final days when everything will come to pass and to this day being totally wrong. It's a book that stories, books, and movies are told about that envision a moment of final rapture when all those faithful people will be taken into the sweet by and by and the rest of us will be left here to suffer. It's a confusing book that people have spent many time, much time focusing on the really strange part, the beasts and the undead, and like Halloween, as a result, have missed the point. Friends, there is a point to the book of Revelation. But it's not about the end of the world. It's about the end of our faith. That is the destination, the end, the journey, the goal towards which we are each journeying. That is what this book is about. Most scholars don't believe that the book of Revelation is somehow about the end of the world. They believe it's about the end of our faith, the goal that is set before us, the destination toward which we are all heading. That is what the book is about, and we miss it if we focus all of our time on the strange imagery. The book was written by an evangelist named John, not the one who wrote the Gospels or the letters, at least we don't think so, just a popular name at the time. Written at the end of the first century by a guy named John to a church that was experiencing some persecution. Seven churches, to be exact, is this letter written to. And each of the churches were facing their own frustration with the Roman Empire. See, the Roman Empire had been ruled by a series of emperors who were growing increasingly ferocious over those who would not worship them as Lord, a challenge for Christians. And so Christians were forced to go underground into house churches and to have their meetings in secret. And it was so secretive and so dangerous to be a Christian at the time that they had to write in code. And so when John was writing, he was writing his correspondence to those seven churches, and we're confident that if those seven churches were still around today, the first 20 chapters of the book of Revelation would make a whole lot more sense to us. But if we listen carefully, the message of hope is still there. And friends, we could use a message of hope. It's November. We're getting towards the end of the year that time and we start to look backward on what we've been through. And truth be told, we've been through a lot this year, not just here at Asbury First, but in our world. We look around and we see the violence and the racism and the poverty that is all around us and we might be tempted to go back and start those calculations making sure we didn't miss something when we were reading this book thinking that the end must be near not to mention the chaos that is in each of our own lives we have likely all experienced our fair share of loss of pain of suffering in this past year. 
We know what it's like to need a message of hope. And maybe like our first century counterparts, we can find it in our text today. John begins our passage simply. After spending 20 chapters detailing all of the pain that these people are experiencing, he sets before them a dream, a vision. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's a way of simply stating there will be a time when what is now is no longer and that something new will come. He's setting before them a new vision, a new heaven and a new earth. And we can hear in the back of it some of those symbolic messages, the sea will be no more. Now those of us who envision the end of our world know that given our environmental crisis, we will likely be having the opposite problem that is not too little sea, but too much. But this is not meant to be taken literally. Remember, this is coded language. It's a story, and we know that the Roman Empire found their power in the sea. He's telling them there will be a moment when that entity, that oppressive entity which has kept them in check, will no longer find their power. He's sending before them a message of hope, a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem that will come down from on high. This is the opposite of the message we typically get when we think about the book of Revelation, the one from the stories where we think we will be raptured up to heaven, a dubious theological claim, hard to justify from the text, and opposite of what is being said now. We do not get raptured up to heaven. God comes down to us. That's the point of the story. That's the message of Jesus Christ, God with us, that God comes to be with us, or as our writer for today says, God makes a home among mortals. Do you see the vision of a new heaven and a new earth is one in which God is found amongst us? In those moments when we have doubt, and we all do from time to time, in those moments when we are wondering where to look for God in the midst of our oppression, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of life, we are to look first to each other. We find God in human relationship, in community, in one person facing another. That is where God is, wherever two or more are gathered. I am there. Isn't that part of why we're here? Isn't that part of what it means to be in a church? That's why certainly we've committed to worshiping together as often as we can in this year ahead and inviting others to join us because we know we are best when we are in this together. That we find God when we find one another in deep, meaningful relationship. This book is not about the end of the world. It is about the end of our faith, where we are going. It's a dream set before us about a new kind of world. We can hear it in the text, what kind of world that will be. He envisions a time in which every tear will be wiped away, when death will not get the final word, when all of those who have pain and suffering will find it no more. Friends, it is a story, a vision of what Jesus called the kingdom of God, and truth be told, it is our dream as well. As I read the dream board, as I receive dreams from the congregation about where you believe God is calling us to be, I hear in it visions, glimpses of our part towards the kingdom of God. It is having the end in mind. We have the end in mind that we're going towards. As we read about the possibility of a bereavement group, we imagine that tear being wiped away. 
as we envision the sanctuary being open to be able to connect with God, with each other during the course of the week, we envision what it means to have God among us. As we hear about new ways to reach out to the children and to the impoverished of our own city, we hear about that time when all need will be met, when pain and suffering will be a thing of the past. This is our moment to dream. My first mentor, the Reverend Dr. Brett McLennigan, used to say the book of Revelation can be summed up in five words. Love wins in the end. Love wins. In the end. That's the goal that is set before us, and let's be honest, friends, that in and of itself is an apocalyptic vision. Because if we were to fully embrace the love of God, if we were to fully embrace reaching out to one another in love, it would indeed change the world. When we hear that dream set before us, our job is not to sit down with pencil and paper and calculate when all of these things will come to pass. No, we're missing the point. Our job is to work to build a world in which these things exist, to pick up the ball while we have it and to carry it as close to the goal as we can get it. Friends, it is All Saints Sunday. It's a day when we recognize our own mortality, that we are only here for a moment and that we have a responsibility to use this moment well. Look around. We are in a church that we did not build. We are sitting in pews that we have not always occupied. We are standing on the shoulders of people in faith who have come before us, and now it's our turn. To be clear, there will come a time when we will not be the ones sitting in these pews. There will come a time when the sharing of the gospel message is no longer our task, but that time has not yet come, friends. We are here now, and it is our time to dream. It will take using each and every one of our gifts, our time, our talent, and our treasure. It will take each and every one of us finding the best use we can to be able to move us just a little closer to that kingdom of God. Last week after Stewardship Sunday, somebody said to me, well, <clears throat> why should I give to the church when there are so many other things in the world that I can give to? And my answer is simple, because the church has an end in sight. We know where we're heading. We point towards it. It's called the kingdom of God. Will we get there? Not if we don't work together. Friends, there are many other places we can give to, many other places we can pledge our time and our talent and our treasure, but friends, this is one that is worth it. Because we will only get there together. We close today by remembering the words made famous by Robert Kennedy, but originally coined by George Bernard Shaw. You see things as they are and ask, why? But I dream things that never were and ask, why not? promise of Jesus Christ is that the best is yet to come. And by the grace of God, if we don't reach it today, tomorrow is always a new day. Thanks be to God. Amen.